Cuba, the largest of the Caribbean islands, was sighted by Christopher Columbus during his first voyage of discovery in 1492 and claimed for Spain that same year. And except having been held by the British in 1762, the country remained predominantly under Spanish rule till the end of the 19th century. Cuba came into international focus in 1898 when stories prompted by U.S. newspaper owners including William Randolph Hearst leapt to the conclusion that the explosion of the armored cruiser, the USS Maine, which was protecting U.S. interests during a Cuban revolt against Spain that same year, was caused by the Spanish. The U.S. became involved in the conflict, though the cause and responsibility for the explosion were never clear and later viewed as a result of an on-ship accident. The slogan, Remember the Maine, to hell with Spain, along with opinions fueled by the press, precipitated events that began the Spanish-American War. The U.S. invaded Cuba, and on December 10, 1898, the U.S. and Spain signed the Treaty of Paris, recognizing Cuban independence. The Cubans never truly received their independence, however. Instead, following the exit of Spanish troops from the island later that month, the government was handed to the U.S. In 1902, the United States finally gave control to the Cuban government. In 1940, Fulgencia Batista, a former army sergeant and revolutionary, won the 1940 election for president. Batista's reign was ended in 1944 by the election of a populist physician, Dr. Ramon Grau San Martin, who inherited the economic boom that resulted from increased sugar prices during World War II. Grau inaugurated a program of public works and school construction. Social security benefits were increased, and economic development and agricultural production were encouraged. But increased prosperity brought increased corruption, nepotism flourished, and the country was also steadily gaining a reputation as a base for organized crime. The country became a naughty tourist destination for those who would enjoy gambling, drugs, and sexual freedom, along with magnificent ocean views and the natural wonders of the island. In 1952, Batista ran once again for president and though expected to get only a small minority of votes, seized power in a bloodless coup ahead of the election. Despite Batista's intent for personal profit from his position, the country flourished during his regime, and according to the International Labor Organization, the average industrial salary in Cuba was the world's highest by 1958, and Cuba had become one of five most developed countries in Latin America. Cuba had more movie theaters than New York, had the eighth number of radio stations in the world, and according to the United Nations, Cuba had one of the highest number of doctors per capita in the world, along with the third lowest mortality rate. But middle-class Cubans who dreamed of enjoying the fruits of the American economy, and not that of Latin America's economy, became increasingly frustrated with the gap between financial success in their country and that of the U.S. There were large income disparities that were reported by some to be the result of privileges enjoyed by Cuba's unionized workers obtained in large measure at the cost of the unemployed and peasants. Between 1933 and 1958, Cuba increased economic regulation which led to declining investments and during the 1950s many graduates could not find jobs and the gross domestic product grew at only 1%. As early as 1953, Fidel Castro, a young lawyer from a rich family, started a crusade to depose Batista's government and with a small army led an attack on the Macondo barracks near Santiago. The attack failed and Castro was captured, tried and convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison. He was released in 1956 by the Batista government when amnesty was given to political prisoners. Castro went into exile in Mexico where he met a socialist freedom fighter, Ernesto Che Guevara. Together they organized a successful guerrilla campaign, the 26th of July movement, with the goal of overthrowing Batista back in Cuba. The middle classes which had become disillusioned with Batista and the unemployment that came about during his regime helped fuel U.S. imposed trade restrictions on Batista's administration, resulting in the U.S. sending an envoy to Cuba with a mission of persuading Batista to leave the country voluntarily. On January 1, 1959, exactly 60 years after Cuba was given its independence from Spain, Batista fled and Castro took over. Within seven days, President Eisenhower sent a new ambassador, 
Philip Bonsai to Cuba to help keep the country within the U.S. sphere of influence. Despite favored reaction by many Cuban citizens and influential Batista opponents toward the U.S. intervention, Castro was repulsed by U.S. domination and paternalism and its connection with the corruption that had been condoned by the U.S. His answer was, Americas are going to pay dearly for what they are doing. When the war is over, I'll start a much longer and bigger war of my own. The U.S. responded with aggressive campaigns against the Castro regime, leading to the U.S. 1962 embargo. In April 2009, President Barack Obama expressed his intention to relax the existing travel restrictions, making it once again legal for Americans to travel to the island country. My wife, two friends, and I visited Havana in November 2009. Our intention in the trip was to create a series of paintings of the city, documenting its decaying beauty from a personal perspective. From what we could ascertain, the people were hopeful for their government to relax its policies and the U.S. government to remove the embargo that has lasted nearly 50 years. Even today in this country, there is still much anger by Cubans and their family in this country who were forced to leave their farms, businesses, and country after the revolution. It would most likely be difficult for change to evolve quickly that will enable for this prodigal son of the U.S. to once more embrace and be embraced by its much larger neighbor only 90 miles away. My exhibition, Havana 59, is not a political statement. It is an artistic crusade to portray a city stuck in time, both magnificent and disenchanting, and to bring it into focus for all to see.